Well, hello and uh, welcome back to the Cincy Reform Podcast. Uh, my name is Zach and I'm here with my co-pastor, Brandon. And uh, today we're going to be talking to you about the uh, Salem Witch Trials. Uh, certainly something that I remember uh, learning about in my American history classes, something that my uh, anti-Christian uh, professors were very quick to talk about and wanted to make sure that we understood how uh, bad uh, Christians were. Um, just to, to clarify, as we talk about these Salem witch trials, uh, we're not talking about the exact same thing as Wicca. We're going to have an episode on uh, Wicca as well. And there might be some overlap and some similarities between you know, witchcraft and the uh, Puritan in New England and, and uh, Wicca, but uh, we're not so equating the two. So just to be clear about that. So the, we're talking about the uh, Salem uh, witch trials today. And uh, let me just set the table here from uh, one historian who spoke about the Salem Witch Trials as um, the phenomena of these trials crackles, flickers, and jolts its way through American history and literature. The matter interests us because Salem represents one of those rare moments in our enlightened past when the candles are knocked out and everyone seems to be groping about in the dark, the place where all good stories begin. Easy to caricature, it is more difficult to comprehend. So Brandon, how about you set the, uh, the scene for us? Uh, tell us about the uh, basics about when and where uh, this event uh, took place. So yeah, quite basically, this event is taking place in Salem Village, um, and that's in the year 1692. During the Salem Witch Trials, five men, 14 women, and two dogs were executed for witchcraft. Uh, so yeah, an, an, an event in which um, uh, there was a lot of lives lost, uh, reputations were soiled, and uh, much chaos was happening. Uh, can you help us to begin to assess the event and what, what should we make of it? So I think it's helpful, you know, approaching this. And I did, <clears throat> I wrote a paper for, in, in, in grad school on the Puritan view of the witch trials, because I wanted to kind of come into the Puritan mindset and ask what is the Puritan theology of witchcraft during uh, this time at Salem Village in 1692? Because oftentimes when you watch a documentary on TV about it, it, it presents it in a very secular way, and they are looking for very naturalistic reasons. You know, that they'll talk about um, the mold that grew on some of the bread that could have caused hallucinations. They will talk about the stress of winter and, and, and uh, Indians raiding and these kinds of things. And I'm sure that there were many stresses, and I'm sure that there might have been some interesting things growing on, on the food. But, uh, but I think to really get to the heart of the matter, we have to kind of come into that Puritan mindset and ask, what in the world did the Puritans believe about witchcraft? And in the paper that I wrote, I first unpacked the nature of a witch. What did the Puritans think about who a witch is or who, who a witch was? And then I spoke about the power of a witch. So given what witches are, what can they do? How can they afflict people? And then uh, thirdly, I got into ways that Christians, ways that the Puritans taught Christians to fight against witchcraft. Uh, fourthly, how Puritans taught to detect who is a witch and who's not a witch. And then finally, how to um, uh, also punish a witch. So kind of walk through uh, the Puritan belief about those. In order to kind of wrap my mind around the Puritan view, um, I dug through some of the, the Puritan books at the time. Uh, one of the books is Cotton Mather. He wrote a book called On Witchcraft. Uh, it is uh, basically what, what he believes about witches. Cotton Mather was instrumental in the, uh, the witch trials. He was you know, responsible for people being um, uh, found guilty and uh, he would bring various evidences, and, and uh, he would in interview those afflicted, and so on and so forth. So he was, he was very much uh, a man on the ground during the Salem Witch Trials. And so his book was very revealing in terms of how he believes and what he thinks about witchcraft in general. Uh, the pastor on the ground, I mean, the pastor who is kind of, you know, ground zero is Samuel Paris. And so this is his sermon notebook. 
and his sermon notebook is very interesting because he's uh, it's basically a journal or a diary and <clears throat> and it it kind of uh, a chronological account of his time as at, you know, at uh, Salem Village being mm-hmm. the pastor and it gets very interesting during the years of the Salem witch trials as he's speaking about what he's seeing and his fears and what's going on there. Um, another instrumental book is by William Perkins, the Puritan. It's called A Discourse of the Damned Art of Witchcraft. Uh, this is actually written before these other ones. Uh, so he's kind of a foundational figure, father of, of the Puritans. And in fact, in Cotton Mather's book, he includes a chapter from Perkins in here. So, um, in fact, what I notice is that as the Puritans are writing during this time, they're all going back to Perkins. Mm. Uh, they're quoting Perkins, they're building on Perkins. Uh, another book is by Nathaniel Holmes, Demonology and Theology. Uh, wrote another interesting book on, on witches and all of that. And the final one that was helpful in terms of getting an understanding of how they're thinking is Richard Baxter's work, The Certainty of the Worlds of the Spirit. Uh, if you've ever seen a modern-day kind of ghost hunting show, this mm-hmm. is kind of it in print. He basically went around to every haunted place and got their tale or had people write them letters about some crazy thing they experienced or a ghost they saw or a witch that they saw. And he would just include the letter wholesale in, in this book. Um, so it's kind of an interesting book, but what was interesting was that, uh, people at Salem Village, 1692, they're quoting Perkins, they're quoting Baxter, they're using these guys as authorities, uh, and bringing to bear on what they think about, about witchcraft. So then you started to, uh, read these books, you've got, you try to get yourself into their mindset and learn about their views on these things, and so what... What did you uh, discover in terms of their view of the witch? What, how did they describe the nature of what a witch was? Yeah. Uh, William Perkins said, Witchcraft is a wicked art serving for the works of wonders by the assistance of the devil so, f- uh, so far forth as God shall in justice permit. So according to Perkins, uh, this is by the power of the devil as, as far as God will allow it to be. Uh, Cotton Mather, he defined a witch this way. He said, witchcraft seems to be the skill of applying the plastic spirit of the world unto some unlawful purpose by the means of a confederacy with evil spirits. So the witch is somebody who is in league with the devil, um, is not, not working in isolation of God's providence, you know, all under God's providence and what he's allowing, but this is something that is of, of, of uh, demonic uh, origin. And they believe that men could be witches, but they would also say, I think Perkins says, that uh, women are more susceptible to, uh, to witchcraft than men were. So they, were, they, they had a closer eye to, to women than to men, although in uh, Salem Village, 1692, some men were executed, including one of the former pastors of the mm-hmm. church. Um, they believe that witches bound themselves covenantally to Satan. William Perkins said, The ground of all the practices of witchcraft is a league or covenant between the witch and the devil, wherein they do mutually bind themselves to one another. And Perkins taught that there could be an open uh, covenant with Satan, but there could also be a secret or a hidden covenant with Satan. So the open covenant with Satan is when the witch outright uh, rejects Christ and renounces God, renounces their baptism, renounces redemption, and they give themselves over to Satan. They sign Satan's book with their own blood. And as they're signing Satan's book, Satan promises to be ready at his vassal's command to appear at any time in the likeness of any creature, to consult with him, to aid and help him in anything that he shall take at hand for the procurement of pleasures, honor, wealth, or preferment, and go for him, to carry him wherever he will, in a word, to do for him whatever he has commanded. So Satan will do that for the witch in an open open covenant. Now, there is something that Perkins calls a secret or hidden covenant, and this is actually scary. 
because you could be in a secret covenant with Satan and not even know it. Oh, wow. So if you hmm. prayed in a superstitious way, wow. you used the word Jesus in a superstitious way, you uh, quoted scripture in a superstitious way, you could actually consent to Satan in your heart, and maybe you're not quite in league with him, but you are on the road to being in league with him. And in that camp, Perkins put all of Roman Catholicism. I can see that was where he was going. Yeah, that's, yep. uh -huh. <laughs> that's exactly where, where he went with that. <clears throat> um, and so these covenants that the witch would bind themselves, uh, they would uh, come with various counterfeit ceremonies. And, you know, just as the Christian church has a church structure, church hierarchy, baptism, Lord's Supper, various rites and rituals and liturgies, so uh, the witches, as they join together, they have kind of counterfeit rituals, counterfeit ceremonies to what God has, has done. Uh, Perkins says that they abominably resemble those of our Lord. Now, Durf, you know, if you want to bind yourself to Satan, uh, Satan can be conjured, they said. He, he most ordinarily comes to you, but he can be conjured. Um, Cotton Mather spoke about how he had 20 people admit to him that they signed the devil's book and entered Satan's horrid service filled with hellish rendezvous and diabolical sacraments for the purpose of destroying the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And... Um, but again, uh, Satan could be conjured. Uh, Mather uh, speaks about how there was a pastor's son in London who was reading a book called Conjuration, and Satan appeared right in front of him, conjured him up. So, Just a quick clarifying question here. So when they're talking about signing a book, is this a, a metaphor, or is this a, a, a physical book that they were signing, or are there different ideas on that, you know? <sighs> There could be different ideas on it. It's often spoken about as an actual book. Interesting. I mean, it's often wow. spoken that way okay. of an actual book. But um, I'm sure that you know, perhaps they could have understood it in a more spiritual sure, context sure, yeah. as well. Yeah. But it's yeah, very much in yeah, physical descriptions hmm. uh, for sure. Uh, you know, as you uh, are in a covenant now with Satan, Satan marks you. And sometimes it's called the devil's mark, the witch's mark. Sometimes it's called the witch's teat because it was red or blue, raised or inverted. It could resemble a nipple or a flea bite. Any kind of mark was, was problematic. And as the witch trials were underway, they found that uh, these marks, especially on genitalia, were very discriminating marks. Uh, you probably have a witch. Um, the purpose of the witch's teat is not because Satan needs blood to drink from, but that it allows the devil to enter the witch's body more readily and to control the witch more effectively. Um, and it just it gets weirder and weirder as you unpack some of these things. They believe that witches had imps. An imp would look like an animal, maybe a mole, maybe a bird. And the imps, the witch would send out to spy. They were kind of like the spies for the witch. They could also do various things. They could uh, hurt people um, and cause a lot of damage. But the imps would have to suckle the witch's teat to get nourishment. And uh, there's one testimony, actually, uh, where a woman came to take care of her sick mom and pulled back the sheets, and there was a mole. Ran out of the sheets, suckling at, at, at her mom's she, she accused her mom of witchcraft, and her mom uh, denied it. She swore that she was not in covenant with Satan, uh, but her daughter um, uh, saw a mole suckling the teat of her mom. Um, other reports in New England account witches suckling birds between their fingers. So they would have birds suckle between fingers. and So uh, all kind of bizarre tales, just, you know, out there tales. Um... Witches could also be uh, black or white, not talking about skin skin color, but talking about evil or quote unquote good. Uh, Perkins weighs in here, and Perkins says the good witch, the white witch, is the most horrible and detestable monster 
For the good witch will appear as a wise man or a wise woman. He or she is still in league with Satan, for this is how he orders his kingdom, appointing to several persons their several offices and charges. So, let's say, for example, a, um, a diabolical witch casts a spell on somebody, and they are afflicted, and they go to a white witch who kind of takes it away and fixes that person, um, Perkins says, The good witch hath done, done him a thousand times more harm. For the one did only hurt the body, but the devil by means of another, though he left the body in, go in a good plight, yet he hath laid hold of, on the soul, and by curing the body hath killed that. And the part that cured cannot say with David, The Lord is my helper, but the devil is my helper. For by him he is cured. The good immediately accomplished his desire by tangling the soul in the band of error, ignorance, and false faith. So the good witch is, is the most detestable, horrid, uh, the devil masquerading as an angel of light in order to deceive. Whereas, and, 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 he, and he's saying, when, when we see a diabolical witch, everybody knows it's evil. Like, you don't have to, to have, have a PhD to know uh, somebody casting spells, hurting people, that's evil. But what people aren't clued in on sometimes is when somebody su supposedly does good and supposedly loves and supposedly heals. Um, but Perkins is noting all of this is coming from a demonic source, not a godly source. So you've already started touching this a little bit in terms of what, um, you know, witches are like the good and the bad, quote unquote. So what, what, tell, tell us more about their power. Um, Tell us more about what they yeah. do and what they set out to do. And... So Mather, uh, Cotton Mather, right up front, you know, he wants to affirm witches, Satan, they're not equal with God. Um, God is, is in, in control. He, is in, uh, he has ordained whatsoever comes to pass. And so witches, like Satan, they are on, on a leash. And so he, he affirms that up, up front. But God does allow, they would say. Uh, Satan to have a short leash during during this time before Christ's second coming, and so witches have a short leash um, until Christ comes back. Perkins highlighted four reasons why God allows witches to afflict uh, His people. One, um, uh, God allows witches to punish the wicked for their sin. So maybe maybe it's a wicked person who's experiencing this, and so. Um, God allows it to punish the, the wicked person. Secondly, to avenge himself of the ingratitude of those who have his word and do not obey it. So, some who have the word of God, not obeying the word of God, maybe uh, witchcraft will kind of arouse them to obey the word of God. Um, third, to arise the godly who are slothful in living and, and living in sin. So maybe you are in Christ, you have been baptized, you are a member of the church, but at the same time, you're just slothful, living in unrepentant sin, and maybe uh, the affliction of a witch will arouse you to repentance. Uh, and fourthly, to test his people in order to see if they cling to him or follow to Satan. So that's um, why Perkins says God allows witchcraft. According to Perkins, witchcraft is actually the chief ordinance in Satan's kingdom. Satan, um, his main, he is... He has many guns, but the biggest one is witchcraft. Uh, that's, the, that's the chief one. Satan's power, he can cause illusions. Uh, he has um, a whole demonic army that is fueling all of this. Um, Satan can cause various optical illusions, it was believed. So Holmes, for example, says, Then again, by his exceeding power and agility, Satan, or the witch, can either change the seeing power of the eye or the condition of the air, or he can trouble the inward fancy, making it to take notice of phantoms present. So by this power of optical illusion, uh, it can appear that a witch turns into a dog or a cat or a wolf, even though that's not actually happening, but Satan is given permission to do something to the eye, do something to the air, uh, do something to something that makes us think the witch turned into a dog or a cat. Probably why dogs were executed during the Salem witch trials. Satan is able to frame dreams, they believed, in the brains of men. 
Uh, so maybe you you fall asleep and Satan can put different thoughts and dreams into your into your your brain. Uh, uh, witches can cast spells, uh, different charms. Uh, they can be made effective to, to diabolical ends. They called the uh, they called spells that witches would cast um, Satan's watchwords. So Satan and his army are all around the world, and when they hear watchwords, they hear these special phrases or chants from the witch, and that will arouse them to go to that witch and carry out whatever that witch is asking them to carry out. Um, they believe that they could create storms. They could even send their specter to do their bidding, and that is actually going to have direct impact into the Salem Witch Trials. They believe that a witch could send their specter, their spirit as it were, to go and hurt people, uh, bite people, hit people, wow. haunt people, afflict people. Um, <clears throat> the specter had the power to, ha to haunt, bite, hit, or even kill, if permitted. Um, Cotton Mather, he, he records that uh, one learned scr Scrimbonius was praying uh, for someone who was afflicted by an evil spirit, but as he was praying for someone afflicted by an evil spirit, he himself had a horrible blow over his face by an evil spirit. And uh, they, they believe this was a spirit of, of, of a witch. Uh, people are afflicted by these specters. And Cotton Mather, he says that these people, thus afflicted, are miserably scratched and bitten, so that the marks are most visible to all in the world, but the cause utterly invisible. And the same invisible furies do most visibly stick pins into the bodies of the afflicted and scale them, and hideously distort and dis disjoint all their members, beside a thousand other sorts of plagues beyond these of any natural disease which they give unto them. Yea, they sometimes drag the poor people out of their chambers and carry them over trees, over hills, or diverse miles altogether. So he's uh, saying that this is, uh, has been happening in New England. Richard Baxter, he records a, a, an event in which a specter came to a woman and the, the specter uh, appeared to be her late husband. And uh, the husband wanted to enter her bed, but she refused. And so, so the specter became violent and started afflicting, and there was black smoke on, on the bodies, bruises all over people. Um, so yeah, this idea of a specter being able to hit, bite, pick you up out of bed, and carry you many miles uh, has been kind of throughout Puritan thought. And finally, one other thing I'll mention is quite bizarre, um, is that it was believed that uh, witches could cause you to vomit up things. And wow. the list, uh, and actually Baxter probably records the most about what people were vomiting up. Here's a short list. <laughs> no. They were vomiting up stones, iron, nails, brass, crook pins, blood, glass, white mercury, head bodkins, Nitra, dogs, hair, bone, veins, chestnuts, flesh, hen's bones, horse teeth, cockle shells, horse dung, feathers, thread, knives, and straw, all of which were reported vomited by the afflicted of the witch. Uh, Baxter records an account of a woman who vomited over 200 crook pins in one sitting and then continued to vomit crook pins for six months, and men inspected her mouth before and after each episode to make sure there wasn't any foul play. They saw no foul play, but she was vomiting these things up. Um, in some cases, there was no damage done to the lining of, of the throat, which was bizarre. Um, it was more discriminating because sometimes somebody would throw something up, but earlier that, that day, they saw it in a basket of somebody they, they think is a witch. So if it was in a witch's basket, it's now in my, in my throat, I'm throwing, throwing it up. Uh, Mather records a testimony of a bee that flew into a boy's uh, mouth and placed uh, penny nails into his throat that he threw up. So, um, yeah, kind of a bizarre power of, of the witch there. That is, that's bizarre, yes. Um, I've never had that happen to me. Yeah. Uh, how, how then did the, the Puritans instruct... Um, <clears throat> the Christians to fight against uh, presumably spiritual warfare primarily uh, against witches. What was the method of confrontation there? So you know, there were <laughs> some remedies that were 
out of the ordinary and, and odd. And then there were some remedies that were, they were, they were quite conventional and actually helpful. Uh, but some of the weird ones, you know, there was uh, one recipe of somebody who talked about mixing various greases and herbs together as a cure for witchcraft. Uh, there was one uh, kind of counter magic that was actually tried in Salem Village, 1692, and the pastor there, uh, Samuel Paris, rejected it. It had to deal with uh, making um, urine bread and feeding it to a dog, uh, some, some bizarre things, a like counter magic. Uh, Samuel Paris rebuked it that, uh, and said that ought not happen, and he said that, that the person was going to the devil for the help against the devil and setting up a satanic lightning rod. And so he, yeah, he said, you're, you're basically going into a witchcraft realm in order to deal with witchcraft. Don't do that. Uh, William Perkins, actually, was probably the most conventional and I would say the most helpful. I mean, if, if there was any, any takeaway, it was kind of the conventional approach that uh, William Perkins had in combating witchcraft because it's also helpful in dealing with just um, the demonic in general or evil spirits in general. Um, and he talked about if one wants to pre prevent from being bewitched, uh, things to do are like becoming a member of the covenant of grace, he said. Uh, partaking of Christ by faith, repenting of sin, living unto God in obedience and newness of life, sitting under the preaching of the word, the, the ordinary means of grace. So he was, it was very much conventional wisdom in terms of if you feel like you're oppressed in, in some way, bewitched or whatever it may be. Uh, availing yourself to the means of grace, to the preaching word of the word, uh, to the singing, to the to the to the worship. Um, but what happens if you're already in witchcraft? So he he kind of gave some preventative measures, uh, and that was uh, being in church and, and these various things. Uh, but then he gave also restorative measures. So what happens if you've you know, maybe you've done all that or whatever, but you're now afflicted by a witch or you think you're being bewitched? What what should you do? Um, Perkins, uh, Perkins, he, he doesn't think that we should go about it the way the apostles did. He would say that apostolic authority of commanding spirits and right. casting out demons and, um, uh, you know, speaking in tongues, he would say all of that has, has ceased. He doesn't believe that that's the route that we should go. Uh, but he says, first, if you feel that you are being bewitched, first examine yourself and try to discover why God has allowed Satan to bewitch you. So he calls for self-reflection. Uh, not that uh, your sin has direct impact on, the, on you being bewitched, but it's a good opportunity for self-inventory. Uh, uh, so, so kind of ask yourself, examine yourself. Secondly, he says, show forth your faith through prayer and fasting. So go to prayer, go to fasting. Uh, spend a season uh, just fasting and praying to God. And finally, he says, endure the affliction as, as discipline from God. Uh, um, just humble yourself under the hand of God, knowing that God's in control, and use that affliction uh, for your benefit. Use that affliction to mature in Christ. Cotton Mather, he actually reaffirms that, that list. He thinks that that's a good prevent, uh, a restorative means if you're bewitched. Cotton Mather adds one more, though. He says that you should be joined to the church. You should consecrate your children. Uh, and all of those are, are good means to, um, to uh, prevent and restore yourself from being tormented by, by a witch. Um, Cotton Mather uh, also said that if you feel like you're bewitched, you should pray this prayer. He said you should say, Satan, thy time with me is but short. Nay, thy time with me shall be no more. I am utterly sorry that it, it has been so much. Depart from me, thou evildoer, and thou... And thou wouldst have me to, to be an evil doer like thyself. I will now forever keep the commandments of that God in whom I live and move and have my being. Uh, the, the Puritans did not believe that uh, the way of the Roman Catholic exorcist was the route to go. They say that was actually going to, to the devil for help against the devil. That was using superstitious witchcraft things to fight against uh, demonic things. So uh, it was a very much uh, a very much simpler approach of the Puritans in terms of basically word and sacrament. And so now kind of starting to wrap this up here, what about figuring out who was a witch? How do they go about that sort of litmus test to discern 
who is guilty of witchcraft. <clears throat> yeah, so in Mather's book on witchcraft, uh, Mather includes a chapter, um, and, uh, and it's actually a summary of Perkins. And in that chapter, he gives eight, eight ways, eight ways in which you can discover a witch. Uh, one, if there is presumption that warrant an occasion for examination. So if something happens that just warrants, you need to examine that person. Secondly, if a man or a woman is defamed for being a witch. So if I just accuse someone of being a witch, that was enough to be examined. Three, if a fellow witch named a witch. So let's say a witch was caught and they tortured the witch and the witch named three other witches. Then that would uh, be uh, cause enough. Fourth, if after cursing a person, death or mischief followed. So if you got mad at your neighbor, cursed your neighbor, shook your fist at your neighbor, something bad happened to them, that means you're a witch. Uh, fifth, if after quarreling or threatening a person, death or mischief follow, kind of like the fourth. Six, if a person is a child, servant, or a friend of a convicted witch. So kind of guilt by association almost. Seven, if a person has the devil's mark. And eight, if the suspect is... Uh, if the suspect is innocent or argues from a guilty conscience. Um, is, uh, in, some, in some places, it was also testified that a witch could not recite the Lord's Prayer without messing up. So they would actually ask every witch who was, uh, who was accused to recite the Lord's Prayer. And as you can imagine, you know, you're being accused of witchcraft. Many people were just nervous, and they might... They hesitated, or they missed a word, or they did, did something, and that was just evidence, you know, because a witch cannot say it perfectly in King James English. So we kind of, um, I guess, discussed the big picture, some of the Puritan outlook mm -hmm. on witchcraft and the, their, their power, how you fight against them, how you discern who witches. Could you maybe bring this back historically then to... The time period we're discussing here, the Salem witch trials, and tell us how, what exactly happened, how did all this uh, play itself out? Yeah, um, so obviously this happened in uh, January of 1692. It actually happened at the Passer's house. So the Passer's house, we kind of like ground zero for for this happening. There were several young girls, um, again two who lived in the Pears household. Uh, they began to have strange fits. They were you know, screaming. They were uh, foaming. Their jaws, their wrists were being uh, kind of bent out of joint. And it, it was very bizarre to everybody, to everybody look, looking on. And there were times where they would appear to be blind. They couldn't see. Then there were times where they appeared to be deaf, couldn't, couldn't hear. Sometimes they would lay on the bed for hours, like uh, just frozen solid. They wouldn't move for hours and hours and hours, wouldn't eat anything. Um, they uh, would have pins under their skin. Some of them would fall into trances and stare off. It was just kind of a, a bizarre thing that began to happen in January of 1692. Um, the, the pastor's uh, kind of gut reaction was to call the doctor. So doctor came and examined everybody, and he said this isn't natural. Like This isn't uh, a medical thing. Uh, he said that he thinks that this is a spiritual thing, basically. Kind of put it back on the pastor. And... Um, so the, the Paris, he started, he, he's starting to think, okay, this is more supernatural, somebody's hurting you, and he encouraged the girls to, you know, name who is tormenting you. Why are you, you know, having pins under your skin? Why are you screaming? Why are you foaming at the mouth? And uh, by the end of February, <clears throat> the girls named three people, one of whom was Tichaba. Tichaba was the slave of uh, Samuel Paris. So she was uh, the household slave. Uh, and the next month, Parrish would preach on March the 27th. He said that our Lord Jesus Christ knows how many devils there are in this church and who they are. So he kind of was preaching to a church, and he says, you know, there's devils all over this church. God knows who they are. They're going to be found out. Accusations begin to fly in the church. He's a devil. She's a devil or a witch. Uh, in total, 150 men and women were formally charged and accused of witchcraft that, that year. Uh, and the examination was pretty suspenseful. It was, it was very intimidating. The subjects were often assumed guilty until proven innocent. So if, 
if you're if you're accused, you're guilty unless you can really give uh, some sort of evidence of your innocence. And um, uh, after a season, actually, Tichuba, under under that kind of torture, she just said, "Okay, I'm a witch." And she actually found out that she had a better time than trying to argue your innocence because you argue your innocence and you just get you just get hung. Whereas if you say confess it and you start naming people, uh, you might have actually a a better time. One historian said arguing one's innocency uh, can often prove deadly. One of the other people killed was Bridget Bishop. Uh, she was um, she was referred to as as an attractive uh, woman in her in her mid fifties. Uh, she had kind of a calm spirit about her, but um, several men came and said that uh, her specter, her ghost, uh, haunted them at night and afflicted them at night. And the courts allowed specter evidence uh, in the courtroom. So if, if you had a charge of, of a specter, that was permissible as, as evidence in court. Apart from spectral evidence, they discovered a teat on her body that she suckled or nursed an imp. Uh, and then uh, they said miraculously, when they went to re-examine her body, the teat had disappeared. So uh, they thought she has to be a witch. In another accusation, a man claimed to have stabbed uh, Bishop Specter's coat. So as he was being afflicted by this ghost in the middle of the night, he took a knife, stabbed the specter, and... As Bridget Bishop sat in the courtroom, her coat had the same tear and the same place that the man said he stabbed the specter. Um, perhaps the most incriminating evidence was that when, during the trial, the girls saw Bridget Bishop, all the girls started screaming and writhing about on the floor uh, and, and saying that it was her, even though, uh, even though she was sitting at the bench they were saying her specter was uh, afflicting them in the pew. And um, one of the examiners, John Hathorne, responded by saying, you are acting witchcraft before us. Uh, Cotton Mather asserted that there was little occasion to prove the witchcraft, it being evident and notorious to all beho beholders. So he's, Mather basically said it was just you know, common sense that she was a witch. Bishop continued to, to plead her innocence. Uh, she uh, claimed that she was, uh, was not afflicting the, the girl. She claimed to have no pact with the devil. She said that she did not know about the, Satan's book or signing it. Um, but still, the examiners, again, very intimidating. They, they, they kept pressing, pressing her. So they would say to her, Goody Bishop, what contract have you made with the devil? Can you not find in your heart to tell the truth? Why have you not a heart to confess the truth? Um, so again, presuming guilty until proven innocent, Mather uh, cited 14 pieces of evidence and testimonies that were brought against Brid Bridget Bishop, and uh, she, was, um, she was convicted and executed on June the 10th of that same year. Uh, again, they, um, they executed uh, 19 people. One, again, was the previous pastor of the church. He was actually in Maine at the time. And they went and got him from Maine, brought him back to Salem, and wow. killed him. So, but the question, I think, remains, though, you know, were these girls really afflicted? What's happening here? Because um, all the examiners said what they saw in the girls was something out of the ordinary, something weird, something spectacular, something that would be very hard to fake. Nevertheless, there is reason to be suspicious, I think, about what, the, what these girls were, were doing. Um, for one, the girls seemed to use the same words as if they agreed on it beforehand. Um, you know, they would announce things like, look to her, or she will have a fit presently, or we shall all fall. And so they would use these words, and they'd all fall together or something. So it almost seemed like maybe, maybe they had uh, kind of came together or something uh, uh, beforehand. But one of, actually, one of, the more telling, uh, one of the more telling things that this was probably not, not real was that when they accused... Uh, kind of a high-ranking wife, or a, a wife of a high-ranking politician, 
uh, <clears throat> they basically got shut down. Like, no, you're not gonna, you're not mm. gonna touch her. And they kind of backtracked and said, okay, well, maybe that was someone else or whatever. Mm. Years later, so you know, as as the Salem witch trials ended and as these girls grew up, one of the girls that I think she accused almost every one of the people who were executed. I mean, her name was was one of of, of them on every list. Her name was Anne Putnam. And in 1706, she, she wrote this. She said, I desire to be humbled before God for that sad and humbling providence that befell my father's family in the year about 1692, that I, then being in my childhood, should by such a providence of God be made an instrument for, accus for accusing of several persons of a grievous crime, whereby their lives were taken away from them, whom now I have just ground and good reason to believe they were innocent persons, and that it was a great delusion of Satan that deceived me in that sad time. I desire to lie in the dust and earnestly beg forgiveness of God, and from all those unto whom I have given just cause of sorrow and offense, whose relations were taken away or accused. So in other words, as Ann Putnam grows, she says, if Satan was, was working in Salem Village, it wasn't in which is afflicting, it was in their accusing. That's where Satan was at work, was in the accusations th themselves. Well, um, well, I guess you're starting perhaps to hint at some lessons to be learned from this. Uh, what other kind of reflections might you have there? Why don't you give, give us this, with a nice bow on it. So what, what, how, what can we learn from the uh, Salem Witch Trials? Yeah. So, I mean, oftentimes the Salem Witch Trials is used, you know, evidence against Christianity right, or yeah. against the Puritans or something like that. In fact, after I wrote the, this paper kind of studying uh, the Puritan view of witchcraft, I actually did a historic tour through Salem um, yeah, with like a tour guide going through the various sites. And it was very much um, hostile against Christianity. I mean, the tour guide, the way it was presented, very much... Um, skewed things. Um, and, and having read kind of the primary sources in the, in the Puritan sources, you could tell that they were really just skewing it against Christianity, against the Puritans. Uh, and again, I, I, I like the Puritans. You know, I love reading uh, John Owen. I mean, Perkins has some fantastic things to say. And so we, you know, I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. don't want to, you know, put a pox on the Puritans. And, and also, it should be said that Puritanism it was a phenomenon that lasted from 1560 to 1710, so a kind of a broad time period. This is happening in 1692 in Salem Village, so this I don't think is representative of every single Puritan, but in terms of uh, boots on the ground in Salem Village, th this was kind of the operative theology, and uh, they looked at P Perkins and Baxter uh, and others. But I, I think in terms of lessons that we can learn is that God wants us to live by his revealed word. Uh, God wants us to live by uh, what he has given to us in the Bible. Uh, Deuteronomy 29, 29, God says the secret things belong to the Lord, but what is given to you is for you and your children forever. And so we should not be concerned with you know the secret things that God has not told us about. We should be concerned to live according to the revealed will of God. And the Puritans at this time, these Puritans, uh, Cotton Mather especially, I think was was uh, delving into various realms of speculation that were unhelpful. So here's something that Mather, Cotton Mather wrote. Mather said that we are safe when we make just as much use of all advice from the from the invisible world as God send it for. It is a safe principle that when God Almighty permits any spirit from the unseen regions to visit us with surprising informations, then there is something to be inquired after. We are then to inquire of one another what cause there is for such things. The uh, peculiar government of God over the embodied intelligence is a sufficient foundation for this principle. Nathaniel Holmes, he spoke about, you know, as he was describing things that, that he had heard about witchcraft, he said that uh, it was documented by many good men. And Baxter seems to have the same approach. You know, as people are writing him letters saying, I saw a ghost in my house, and he's including it in, in his book, uh, there was just this idea 
that if God allowed you to see a witch or a, a spirit or a phantasm or something, that you could then incorporate that into your body of knowledge. So you could incorporate what somebody told you about a witch's teed and imps and all these things into your body of knowledge, and it can become part of your theology. And that was um, something that was uh, on, on board back then, and I think that that's part of the problem, that kind of sp speculative... Um, somebody saw a weird thing out in, out in the forest, and now I'm going to incorporate it into my uh, body of theology. I don't think that's a healthy practice. I think that we should live by the revealed will of God. Uh, and I, again, I do like some of the advice that Perkins gave in terms of just availing ourselves to the means of grace and being in word and sacrament uh, each week. It is interesting to note, too, that during this time, there was a debate happening among the Puritans and it kind of goes to show you how far speculation can go, because the Puritans were, de were debating, can these, these spirits that are attacking people, could it be Satan in disguise? So could, could Satan attack someone in the appearance of Bridget Bishop, who was executed? Right, right. And, so, and again, how, how far are we going to speculate here? Yeah. Uh, and the Puritan judges said, no, God wouldn't allow that hmm. to happen. God would not allow Satan to take a form of somebody who's good and afflict somebody to accuse them. Hmm. Uh, so therefore, Bridget Bishop has to be a witch, therefore she's executed. So uh, again, when you get into this realm of speculation, there, there's just no end. Uh, appreciate your work on this, Brandon. Thanks for uh, uh, helping to explain a lot of that to, to us. Um, hope that you appreciate it as well. This is the uh, Sincere Form Podcast. Uh, my name is Zach. I'm here with my co-pastor, Brandon. Thanks for uh, joining us this week. We hope it's been uh, helpful for you, encouraging to you. Um, make, maybe make you think a little bit. And uh, hope you join us next week. Uh, do note that this is a podcast sponsored by Westside Reform Church. Uh, we invite you to join us. Check out our